Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Artist First World Radio Network, home of the best new music you've never heard, and home of the best new talk shows you need to hear. Please don't forget to visit our archive page at www.artistfirst.com, where you can hear all our past shows for free and on demand. You are tuning into High School Football America, small towns, big games. You can hear this show every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information about this show, please visit artistfirst.com slash jefffisher.htm. And now here's your host of High School Football America, Jeff Fisher. Thank you very much, Corey, and good evening, high school football fans across America. Welcome to High School Football America for August the 11th. What a great show we, we have for you tonight. Now, when it comes to wins on the high school football field, we've got two of the best in America. Uh, more on that in just a moment. But uh, what really gets the blood pumping tonight is the season officially begins this weekend with games in Alaska and Hawaii. Yes, they're off the, uh, the lower 48, but nonetheless, High school football will kick off. You want to check out the schedule of games uh, in both of those states, you can go to uh, my blog. Just go to the uh, highschoolfootballhuddle.blogspot.com or highschoolfootballamerica.com and click on the Alaska and Hawaii news. We'll have all of the information, all of the schedules for this weekend uh, up on the site. 31 states now in full swing with two-a-days and more to enter the fray in the next week. Remember, you can keep up to date with high school football news from around the country. Yes, every state. All you have to do is go to uh, the High School Football Wire, which is located as one of the pages on highschoolfootballamerica.com. You can also follow highschoolfootballamerica.com on Facebook and Twitter. Just go to our website, click on the icons at the top of the page. Otherwise, if you'd like to search things out, the Twitter handle is HSFBAmerica. If you have any comments during the show, please feel free to contact us on the High School Football America Facebook page. Just search High School Football America, click like, and uh, you can converse back and forth with with us. Now let's uh, talk about tonight's great show lineup. We have America's top two winningest coaches on the show. On the show tonight we'll have uh, J.T. Curtis of John Curtis Christian School in Louisiana. J.T. entering the season just eight wins away from 500 victories. The Patriots have won 23 Louisiana State Championships, which is the most by any school in the state. And we'll also then talk to the number one guy on the list, 84 years young, John McKissick of Somerville High School in South Carolina. He's won a mere 586 games as he enters his 60th season at the school. And we'll wrap up the show with a conversation with Rashid Ghazi, who is uh, the director of the film Fortson Faith, Fasting, and Football, it's a documentary film about the Fortson High School football team in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a predominantly Arab-American football team that deals with uh, the last 10 days of the Muslim Holy Month holiday, Ramadan, during the 2009 season. And uh, we'll talk to uh, Rashid about that now. Some of the other topics that we'll, we'll cover on the show tonight. Uh, some sad news. Another high school football player has died on the practice field. This time it's uh, in Arkansas. We'll have more on that story. Uh, up in Massachusetts, the city of Gloucester, trying to sell the naming rights to the city's high school sports stadium. Of course, they do it uh, at the pro level and the college level. Now, with these tough budget situations, looks like uh, one city is going to test the waters, and who knows, we may have this as something that happens uh, around the country. And uh, finally, another uh, piece of news we'll talk about, in addition to a lot of headlines from around the country, uh, Kentucky signs a big deal to keep its football championships in Bowling Green. Time to thank our sponsors tonight. Blitz Group is a proud sponsor of High School Football America. Blitz Group is HSFA's media strategist. For more information, go to their website at blitzgroupllc.com. Also uh, partnering tonight with the High School Rudy Awards. They're getting ready to uh, kick things into high gear around the beginning of uh, next week. They honor inspirational high school football players who best define their four C's, character, courage, contribution, and commitment. Go to high school football, I'm sorry, highschoolrudyawards.com to learn how to nominate a player. And we're also sponsored tonight, as always, by the National High School Coaches Association. Uh, it's one simple mission for the NHSCA to provide leadership and support to coaches and administrators and their programs. For more information and to join, go to their website, nhsca.com. If you'd like, uh, if you like what you hear on the show here and you want to become a sponsor of High School Football America, please uh, drop me an email. Just write me at jeff at highschoolfootballamerica.com. I'll get you a media kit, and you can learn how to become part of High School Football America, and we'd love to have you as part of that. Time to take our first break. When we, we return on High School Football America, we're going to go to South Carolina and talk with the number one man when it comes to wins in high school football. His name, John McKissick. His school, Somerville High School. 
outside of Charleston. We're going to talk to Coach McKissick when we return. This is High School Football America on the Artist First Radio Network. The hottest technology in the world isn't being developed in Silicon Valley. In the United States Navy, more top-secret technologies are being created than ever before. Incredible machines made of stealth materials that fly by themselves. The only problem with these incredible technologies? It's a shame the enemy can't see them. To learn more, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. You've heard of being named All-Conference, but only one organization has earned the classification of being All-World. The United States Navy. Whether it's humanitarian efforts, fighting terrorism, or protecting America's freedoms, the Navy is the team that helps us all win big. To learn how you could make it to the big league, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. The Navy Seahawk helicopter has a lift capacity of over 6,000 pounds. But when it comes to helping those around the world who need it most, they lift the hopes of millions. To learn more about how the Navy is the best place to do great things, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. It will do you and the world a load of good. Navy. Accelerate your life. If you don't clean up your room, the Board of Health is going to condemn it. The Board of Health doesn't even know about your room. What's more, they don't care. You know, if you keep making that face, it's going to freeze that way. Not unless you're someplace really, really cold. Actually, a lot of the warnings moms hand out are exaggerated. If you don't get your blood pressure checked, you could have high blood pressure, not even know it, and you could die from a stroke. But she's right about that one. Call the American Heart Association or visit our website to learn more. I'm a good driver. I look for cars. I pay attention. I, I should have seen the little girl in the crosswalk. Please, look for pedestrians. Stop for them. Think of the impact you could make. A message from the Federal Highway Administration. This is Mark Marshall. You're listening to the Artist First Radio Network. You can find out more about me at markmarshall.com and find out about my album at iTunes. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned to the Artist First Radio Network. And now back to the show with your host, Jeff Fisher. Thank you very much, Corey. Welcome back to High School Football America tonight. Just a, a wonderful show. I'm just really looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's rare when you can get two legends in high school football onto the uh, show at the same time. And we have uh, the, the two best, the, the number one and two winning as coaches in America. And we're going to start with a guy at the top of the list, and I'm, I'm just really looking forward to talking to him. His name John McKissick, heading into his 60th season at Somerville High School in South Carolina, which is outside of Charleston. Uh, along the way, after 60 years, just, you know, a mere 586 wins, 10 state championships. He's in just about every Hall of Fame out there. So, so Coach McKissick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, it, you know, the, the numbers are just really, really incredible, and, and they kind of speak for themselves. And I wasn't really sure when I was trying to come up with the questions for you where I start because your career is so long, but let's start with the numbers. You know, number one in the nation, 586 wins, the championships. What do numbers mean to you, if anything at all? Well, you know, everywhere I go now, they said, Coach said, uh, you're going to hang around till you get 600 wins. I said, I hope I hang around till I can get 587. That's I'm 586 now. I want 587. I don't worry about anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to take the the, the proverbial one game at a time. <laughs> well, let's let, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, you know, when did you first know you wanted to be a high school football coach, and how did you go breaking into the job at Somerville? 
Well, when I was in high school, it, it looked like to me when I was out playing high school football and I started playing in the seventh grade. Back when I, I'm old, so back when I played, we didn't have 11 grades. And uh, so I started playing JV. Uh, well, we did, we called it midget football back then, JV football when I when I was in the seventh grade. And then uh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh was the, was the uh, four years of high school. And uh, it looked like to me that uh, I always uh, looked at my, my my coach. We didn't have but one coach, and it looked like to me he was having a good time and enjoying it. And I said, you know, this this might be a good job if. Uh, later, later down the line. <laughs> <laughs> well, sixty years later down the line, you, you think you made the right call? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about you know what happens over the course of six decades. You know what what are let's start with first in in the sport itself. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen at the high school football level? Uh, well, when I first started here in Somerville, I coached a year before I came here, and uh, of course it. Uh, it was six-man football, and we won seven games, and we don't count that in the national uh, national record. Uh, 586, if you want to talk about records, uh, was all at Somerville High School. And back then, when I first came here, uh, I got the job because I didn't I, uh, I didn't ask the superintendent how much it uh, how much it paid, <laughs> and a lot of people wanted it, and. Uh, because it's a good town, Flower Town in the Pines, right 25 miles uh, north of Charleston. It's uh, just a bedroom community and a, and, a, and a good place. But all the kids that came out for football was coming out for football to get out of work. Now, when they come out for football, it is work. So that's the biggest difference I see. Okay. And, and, and what about yourself? How have you changed through the years as a coach? Well, you you uh, you change with the times a little bit. I'm still uh, I'm still the old school. I don't I don't have earrings. I don't have long hair. I had I had a kid out in spring practice had had uh, dreadlocks and buns and and uh, I told him I wasn't gonna give him a uniform. So his mama went and got a lawyer and and the lawyer said you know uh, said uh, uh, high school athletics is is a privilege and not a right. And said so the coach might have an asinine rule, uh, but uh, as far as the law is concerned, he's okay. So they dropped it and let it go. But I'm I'm still that way. I'm kind of the old school. I, I'm not gonna have uh, goat peas and, and and all that stuff drawing attention to themselves. I tell our kids if they want to draw attention to to themselves and do something good on the field, they get a lot of attention. Uh, that, you know what? Sound advice has not changed in 60 years is what you're telling me. Now, now you can't have, you know, this much success where you spend time away from family and all that. So so tell me about how, how your wife and, and your family have kind of helped you in your career to make sure that you were able to get out there as much as you wanted to coach these boys. Well, my wife has never said anything about uh, uh, what, what I was doing. Uh, if I wanted to uh, spend long hours out there, she'd welcome me when I came home, and uh, she was always real supportive. And then all the years that I've been here, she missed three games, and uh, two of them was baby born, and the other one was when my father died. And she went there, and I coached, and uh, so I've had great support at home. Well, that, that, and that's an important thing. Now let's let's kind of get to the the football field itself and this year's team. But let's let's first start with the foundation that you created, uh, you know, 60 years ago. What is the foundation? What what does Somerville football mean to people that uh, aren't in South Carolina that are listening around the nation? Well, it's a lot of tradition here. We uh, when I came here, we probably had as fine a uh, uh, facilities anywhere in the state. We had concrete stands and we held. Uh, 4,000 people and had good press box and everything and there are a lot of other other programs that caught up with us that might have might have bypassed us a little bit in facilities and and all that but it's a lot of tradition in Somerville and uh, in fact I told our guys today from the left right I said you know every time we line up to play the team that we're gonna play they expect us to win. They expect Somerville to win. And then if you don't really get after this, they say, well, they ain't so tough. And then uh, then we have a hard time. And uh, so it, it's uh, uh, the people who move into this community from 
other places, they get caught up in it. We have big crowds and uh, have a nice stadium, and uh, we, we have a lot of support. Talking with Coach uh, John McKissick from Somerville High School, America's winning as coach tonight on High School Football America. So, Coach, let's talk about 2011, team number 60 for you. Tell me a little bit about this team. What do you expect out of it? And maybe a couple of key players that uh, people should know about. Well, we we, uh, we started on July the 29th. And the state of South Carolina, the high school league, they they allow so many practices. And uh, if we go over three hours, and that counts as two practices, and uh, so I practice one in the morning. Uh, our exchange club in town, they, they, they'll take them to uh, the Rhines after the morning practice and feed them, bring them back, they lay around and rest. And uh, then in the afternoon, we'll have another practice about an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, uh, the state of South Carolina, the high school league, they allow all the schools in the state uh, uh, for uh, I call them exhibition games, four scrimmage games. And uh, so we've already played two. We're going to Columbia tomorrow and play a team out of, out of Columbia at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. We've been playing them in the morning because of the thunderstorms and showers and all that, raining them out in the afternoon. And uh, so everything's going real good. That's how we do it. Okay, well, do, do we have a couple of players that uh, we should give a little props to that you think will be leaders on this team this year? Well, we got a defensive back that led the state in interceptions last year. He's a real good baseball player and, and, and a good player. We got a quarterback. This, uh, this will be his third year of starting. But uh, we kind of thin. We, we, uh, uh, they built another school in our school district and took away some of them. And, uh, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, how we'll do, but uh, we're working hard, and I'm, I'm hoping everything's going to be okay. All right. Well, you know, uh, after 60 years, I guess nothing gets you too excited, right? <laughs> you just got to keep it going easy, right? So yeah. so is it unfair to ask you, after all these years, if you have a favorite win, a favorite team, or a favorite moment as the head coach of Somerville? Uh, I, I imagine uh, the first state championship we won might be the, the most excited probably that I've been and then you know uh, sometimes things are not as good as they seem and then sometimes things are not as bad as they seem but that seemed pretty good to me back then. <laughs> All right well I, I'm sure you've gotten this question uh, probably thousands of times but I, I gotta ask it uh, how long are you gonna keep doing this? Well you know uh, I, I get that question a lot of times and I just say one year at a time I enjoy going to work. We've been in uh, two a days now since uh, the 29th. I set my clock at 5 o'clock in the morning to get up and spend the day out at school. And uh, and uh, I kind of enjoy doing it. And, and all my buddies my age, I'll be 85 in September, all, all my buddies my age, that uh, not all of them, but most of them that retired, they they passed on. I, I don't, I'm not ready to pass on. I got four great grandchildren. I want to see what's going to happen to them. Well, that, that that sounds like that sounds like a good plan. Continue living. <laughs> well, uh, let let's uh, two more questions, and I'll let you go. Uh, you you mentioned before, you know, the the number six hundred. Uh, how important is it for you to get to that number? You know, uh, people remind me about it, but it, it's really not impo that important. I I want to win the first game. And then, I want, then after that's over, I want to win the next one. If it totals up to 600 in the end, I'll, I'll be happy for all the kids and, and, and everybody that wants that. But right now, that's not my my real goal. My my goal is one game at a time, and I think you people that keep up with that, that you understand what I'm saying. Absolutely, and we'll be the ones saying, hey, guess what? He hit not, Coach just hit 600. So before I let you go here, uh, coming up in a few minutes, we're going to bring in your, your the guy chasing you. He's eight wins away from 500, uh, J.T. Curtis down at uh, John Curtis. And, and anything you want to say to J.T. before he well, comes? Well, what I'd like to say, I keep up with him. He's done a great job, and, 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 and it's, it's good high school football in Louisiana. And uh, I got a guy that uh, played for me that's uh, – He's at Tulane now, but he was down at Louisiana Lafayette, and uh, he was the offensive coordinator at uh, Virginia Tech, Ricky Bustle, and and I, I know what kind of football. And, and uh, Ricky told me the other day, he told John Curtis, he said, "You better, you better keep keep winning, because Coach McKenzie's gonna keep on winning." <laughs> <laughs> well.
Well, that that sounds like a plan. I'd love to see both of you. Let's go. Let's go for seven hundred and six hundred both. That's oh, that's it, mate. Yeah. All right, Coach. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight, and it's been a lot of fun and continued success and and everything in 2011. Well, I appreciate your interest. Okay. Thank you very much. That's Coach okay. John McKissick. The Tell John coach. Curtis I said hello. I will do that, Coach. Okay. And uh, that's John McKissick, the all-time winningest coach in America. And as he mentioned, you heard him say say hello to John Curtis. J.T. Curtis, the head man at John Chris, John Curtis Christian School, coming up next on High School Football America on the Artist First Radio Network. Okay, see you. The hottest technology in the world isn't being developed in Silicon Valley. In the United States Navy, more top-secret technologies are being created than ever before. Incredible machines made of stealth materials that fly by themselves. The only problem with these incredible technologies... It's a shame the enemy can't see them. To learn more, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy, accelerate your life. You've heard of being named All-Conference, but only one organization has earned the classification of being All-World, the United States Navy. Whether it's humanitarian efforts, fighting terrorism, or protecting America's freedoms, the Navy is the team that helps us all win big. To learn how you can make it to the big league, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. The Navy Seahawk helicopter has a lift capacity of over 6,000 pounds. But when it comes to helping those around the world who need it most, they lift the hopes of millions. To learn more about how the Navy is the best place to do great things, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. It will do you and the world a load of good. Navy, accelerate your life. If you don't clean up your room, the Board of Health is going to condemn it. The Board of Health doesn't even know about your room. What's more, they don't care. You know, if you keep making that face, it's going to freeze that way. Not unless you're someplace really, really cold. Actually, a lot of the warnings moms hand out are exaggerated. If you don't get your blood pressure checked, you could have high blood pressure, not even know it, and you could die from a stroke. But she's right about that one. Call the American Heart Association or visit our website to learn more. And now back to the show with host Jeff Fisher. Hi. Thank you very much, Corey. And uh, the voice you just heard there is the head coach at John Curtis Christian School in Louisiana, J.T. Curtis. Uh, we just heard from John McKissick, number one on the all-time wins list. And right behind him, well, sort of right behind him, eight wins away from 500 is J.T. Curtis. So, J.T., welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, being on with a guy like McKissick is, uh, is really special. I mean, he is a he is an icon. There's no question about that. Well, the only message he told me to tell you before we get into the real questions is you got to keep winning because he's going to keep winning. He's not retiring. So that was the <laughs> message you wanted. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, they asked me, and I said, look, I don't know if I can go to 85 in this Louisiana heat. I said, I, I don't know if I can hang in there that long. But certainly, <laughs> certainly the accomplishments that he's had uh, are, just, are just unbelievable. And, 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 you know, the influence he had on, on high school kids, uh, through all these years, I mean, you can't measure the value of that. I, unfortunately, we just lost uh, our high school coach, a boy, a uh, man named Bob Whitman, that uh, uh, ended up his career with the uh, San Francisco 49ers, the director of scouting, the three Super Bowl champions. And, and, you know, he was such a positive influence, not only in my life, but uh, in the lives of hundreds of young men that have gone on to be tremendous uh, uh, people in their community. And I know uh, John's done the same thing in his area. Yeah, it's certainly. And let's let's kind of talk a little bit about uh, John Curtis Christian. I, I've I've only known it from afar. I know it was started by your dad back in the '60s. You're the headmaster there. So let's start with uh, with telling the listeners exactly, uh, you know, what your dad did back in the '60s to create this. Why did he create the school? Why did he why did he find it? You know, it was an interesting story. He was involved in uh, what we call pioneer mission work as a pastor in Illinois. And he was a Southern Baptist minister that was on a, a mission field, and uh, he was bivocational and was out one day visiting, and someone said to him, uh, you sound like you're an educated man. And he said, well, I am an educated man. I've got a, a double degree from uh, Louisiana College in, in uh, English and Spanish. And the guy looked at him and he said, 
what we needed, he was a Spanish teacher in high school. And that's how he got into education. And from that, uh, thought that there would be a need for a, a, a Christian school uh, that is non-sectarian. We are not supported or involved with another church or organization, or we're not uh, sponsored by a group of people. We are uh, an independent school system, and we want to be that way because uh, we feel like that it's uh, a personal relationship with God through Christ is what our message is, and we work hard to try to make sure that that uh, has continued, even though he has passed on. That's the mission of our school. And well, uh, he just felt very strongly about that. He loved athletics, and uh, both the, for the men and the women, and we have uh, been able to have some success because of the foundation he laid for us. you got some big shoes to fill there, certainly, and, and Dad, you've done a great job. Almost 500 wins, 23 championships, the most in Louisiana. So when you start thinking back at the success you've had, uh, as a football coach there. What comes to mind? Is there a couple of things that stand out where you go, wow, I'm really proud of that? Well, you know, obviously that first group in 1975 that won that first state championship, no one knew about. Nobody had any expectations. And, and certainly we didn't know where the, the journey that we were on, but uh, got ourselves in that championship game and won it 13-12 uh, to 12 on the, in the last a couple of seconds of the game. And, you know, those, those memories never leave you, but you know, what's interesting about high school football is that every year is different. Uh, every team's a new challenge, and, and they all present their unique uh, uh, challenges. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy most about high school football is, is, the, is the building of the team uh, uh, from year to year with different personnel, different personalities, and being able to put together a squad that's able to compete at a very high level. And, and, and really, it's hard to single out any one player or any one play or any one game. Uh, but it's just it's been exciting through the uh, 40 years that I've done this. So let's talk about the challenge of 2011. You uh, just got to the practice field. Uh, camp opened in Louisiana on Monday. So uh, what are some, who are some of the players that uh, people should look out for uh, on the team this year to give you a success? Well, we've got, uh, we've, we've got two that have committed. One is uh, committed to LSU, a big tight end, 6'5", 250-pound tight end, a boy named Dylan Thornton that's uh, uh, going to be a big-time player, has a chance to play not only at the professional uh, high school level, but uh, perhaps at the professional level, too. And then we've got an uh, outside linebacker, uh, Tory Bell, that is committed to Mississippi State, uh, that's an outstanding player that's got a chance to, uh, uh, to really make some noise in the SEC. Uh, we, we feel really good about our junior class. We've got a really exciting junior class uh, uh, with some young men that can run and some size. I bet the biggest offensive tackle I've ever had is uh, he's going to be right at 6'8", right at 330 pounds, and wow. you know, really put together and, and can really move his feet. And He's a 56-plus uh, foot shot putter as a, uh, as a, in his sophomore year going into his junior year. So He's really a skilled athlete, young man that really feel uh, has got a bright future. Our quarterback is a guy that can play. Not a big guy, uh, but a guy that can really play. Throw the football, uh, about six foot, about 185 pounds. That's good speed for uh, Patrick Morton, who uh, we think has uh, had a chance to be a big play guy for us. And uh, So uh, those guys are who I think are going to be some of the, the recruits through the next this year and the next year that will be big time guys. Okay, we're talking with J.C. Curtis, head coach of John uh, Curtis Christian. And, and, and Coach, let's uh, talk a little bit about your national ranking. Max Preps in the small school poll has you number two. Number five, your, uh, your enemy there, Evangel Christian. You lost to them in the 2A championship game. Tell the, the listeners a little bit about that rivalry between you two schools. Well, it's, it's, you know, Evangel Christian is a, it's an excellent program. I mean, they're a team that can compete with anybody in, in the country. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to play some of the better teams uh, across the country, and as they have. And, and so they take a lot of pride in, in, in how they run their program. And uh, we played them and, uh, and lost to them last year in, in, in the championship, and it was a great football game. And, and we would anticipate an opportunity maybe to play them again. And, uh uh, you know, they're just a program that, that has really emphasized uh, excellence in, in a lot of their, in a lot of all their sports, it's, it's just as we have. We're the opposite ends of the state. They're in Shreveport. We're in, the, obviously, New Orleans. So uh, we're two ends of the states, but we've been fortunate enough to meet for the state championship several times, and uh, they've been really highly competitive games. 
Okay, two quick questions, and we'll let you go. I know you got to run into something, but uh, Louisiana High School Athletic Association uh, studying what could create a super conference. You guys are at 2A. You had played a, a lot above that uh, years ago until it was changed. Uh, what, what's your thinking on uh, creating a super conference where you guys can kind of go back up and maybe play the bigger schools? Well, you know, first of all, we, we still do that. We, we play the, the big schools, all the, the better teams in our state. Uh, we play in our, in our preseason. We'll play uh, three of those uh, top teams in our state this year. And, uh, uh, state champion in 4A, we'll play the state uh, semifinalist in 5A. We're going to play the state uh, quarterfinalist in 5A that have already got 11 commitments at the Division One level. Uh, it's going to have a chance to make a run for the championship. So, championship. so we're going to play the best teams that we can possibly get on our schedule. Uh, and, 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 you know, I can't control what the state does. I mean, we're going we're gonna to line up and play, and we're going to do the best we can. The Super Conference has some merit to it, but it also has some drawbacks. And, and one of the drawbacks is to, is to be able to fill the entire conference. Because if you're a good team but not a team that maybe is a great team, uh, then you would be better off playing in your right to division rather than the Super Conference. And, and having a chance to win the championship in your division. So there's some drawbacks with the Super Conference, but the state is a very progressive state. Uh, we work hard to try to – we have excellent rules. Uh, it's preparation for our season and our football. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure that we'll be working something out here in the next year or so to, to make sure that the very best teams are playing in the, in the very best conferences. All right, let's uh, go with the big question as we let you go here. Uh, 500 should come this year. You're, you need eight victories to get there. Uh, what, what will that mean to you when you hit that magical 500? You know, I, I'm going to be, really be honest with you here, and, and I certainly don't mean to be uh, uh, coy or trite in any way, but, you know, so many people deserve credit for those 500 wins. I mean, uh, I mean I've got two coaches on my staff that have been with me 35 of the, of the 40 years that, that I've been coaching, and uh, those guys are just tremendous value to us and to our kids, and, and so many teams have contributed to, to those wins. And, and I really feel that way, that, you know, it's not a, it's not a one-man show by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, our kids are highly committed. Uh, and, and starting back in 1969 when I first took over, and, and we were 0-11, didn't win a game and scored two touchdowns. I mean, those kids are part of that. Uh, they're part of that tradition that was being built back in 1969. So it would certainly be a milestone and certainly puts you in a very elite class. But uh, it's not about uh, J.T. Curtis. It's about uh, all those that have contributed uh, uh, both from a player standpoint and a coaching standpoint and, and the parents and the administration. Uh, and, again, I don't mean that to be trite in any way. I, I think unless all those things are in place, uh, then you're not going to be a have the kind of success that you'd like to have. No, it, it came off the way it should have come off. And, I mean, you really put it in perspective when you talk about an 0-11 start to what you have right now. So congratulations, and we really appreciate you joining us on the show tonight. Hey, thank you very much. Look forward to doing it in the future. Just uh, best of luck to Coach. And uh, if you talk with him, tell him I said he's got the guitar sometime soon because it's about ready to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Coach. Thank you. Have, have a great 2011. That is Coach J.T. Curtis at John Curtis High School, a Christian school in in Louisiana. He is closing in on 500 victories, but as you heard him say there, he's referring to uh, Somerville's John McKissick, number one at the top of the list, and we heard John say earlier uh, in the show, he's not retiring, so they're both going to have to keep going on and, and winning football games. And, and the important thing that they've done is what they've done for young men and have sent them on to, uh, to colleges and, and great careers and great starts to their life. So uh, congratulations to both John and JT. Going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go around the country, take a look at the headlines from the week that was and a look ahead. That and more coming back on High School Football America on the Artist First Radio Network. The hottest technology in the world isn't being developed in Silicon Valley. In the United States Navy, more top-secret technologies are being created than ever before. Incredible machines made of stealth materials that fly by themselves. The only problem with these incredible technologies? It's a shame the enemy can't see them. To learn more, Call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy, accelerate your life. You've heard of being named All-Conference, but only one organization has earned the classification of being All-World, the United States Navy. 
Whether it's humanitarian efforts, fighting terrorism, or protecting America's freedoms, the Navy is the team that helps us all win big. To learn how you can make it to the big league, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. And now back to the show with your host, Jeff Fisher. Thank you, Corey. What a show here on High School Football America tonight. Talk to the two winningest coaches in high school football in America, John McKissick at Somerville in South Carolina, and then just a few minutes ago, J.T. Curtis from John Curtis Christian School in Louisiana. Between them, they are basically at 1,100 victories over the course of about 103 years of coaching uh, young men and young women. Uh, actually, young men. <laughs> I don't think either one has had a, uh, a girl on the roster. But uh, let's uh, remind you that you can follow High School Football America on Facebook. Just go on Facebook and uh, search High School Football America. You can follow us on Twitter. And you can do that by searching our handle at HSFB America. And uh, if that's too much for you, just go on to the website, highschoolfootballamerica.com, and click on the icons at the top of the page. Time to travel around the country, look at the uh, high school football news from the week that was. It's starting in North Carolina. This came out yesterday, and I think this story is going to get a lot of national coverage before it's all said and done. It's one of those stories that proves that sometimes rules are meant to be broken, or at least in some cases they need to be bent a little bit. On the surface, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association doing the right thing. It's uh, following a rule not to allow 19-year-old Brett Bowden of Hobson High School to practice and play with his team because he's over the state's age limit for participation. However, Bowden, who's a junior, has Down syndrome, and this is where I think the common sense needs to come in a little bit. Uh, Bowden has uh, spent the better part of two seasons wearing a full uniform during the games and practicing with his teammates. Now, according to several uh, published reports, Bowden's teammates in the community have found his uh, – you know, position on the team to be very, very inspirational, as you can imagine. And that's been evidenced by the fact that more than 48,000 people have signed up for Let Brett Bowden Play on Facebook. He has a page for that, and that's happened over just the last two days. Now, the rule states that student-athletes who turn 19 on or before August 31st are ineligible to play. Brett turned 19 in May. Now, yesterday, uh, one story headline from FoxNews.com read that Brett had been kicked off, quote-unquote, kicked off the team, and that caused the NCHSAA Commissioner Davis Whitfield to issue a statement that read, I want to be clear that the student athlete has not been kicked off of the team, Whitfield said. Brett Bowden could still be part of the team, lead his team on the field, wear his jersey, and be with his teammates, including some of the postgame activities that he's done in the past. And then Whitfield added, the only thing that he cannot do that he what he cannot do now that he could do before is dress out in full uniform. Since a student must be eligible to be dressed for a contest, he's over the age limit based on the eligibility rules, and this state board of education policy is one that they're not allowed to set aside. So the bottom line here, as far as I see it, you know, rules are rules. I'm not saying break rules. However, in this case, what's going to hurt if you let Brett suit up for the game as long as he doesn't go into the game and you know, participate in an actual game. So, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that common sense prevails and Brett is allowed to wear his uniform proudly once again. I think that's going to make everybody smile. Now, fall sports practices began earlier this week in Illinois, and with it came news that the Illinois High School Association will continue to test its athletes for performance-enhancing drugs. During the 2010-11 school year, the IHSA tested 747 student-athletes. There were four positive tests. Two of the four athletes were cleared by a medical review officer. The other athletes, uh, they were punished. Uh, both uh, were punishable tests. So uh, the testing program began in 2008 and 2009. That school year, over the first three years, uh, only four negative tests, and true, true, truly, out of the 1,758 tests that were administered. Uh, some people look at the number of positive test results and conclude that the testing is not working, said uh, Marty Hickman, who is the IHSA executive director. But it's important to maintain perspective. The scope of our testing was uh, never going to be large enough to catch every student who may be using performance-enhancing drugs. The program was put into place to be a deterrent to help prevent students from using these harmful drugs, and we believe it's successfully serving that purpose. That's what uh, Hickman said. Well, uh, some sad news, as we mentioned at the top. For uh, the uh, second year in a row, an Arkansas high school football player has died during fall camp. A 15-year-old Gurdon High School sophomore died during uh, his team's practice 
on Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday evening, law enforcement authorities uh, reported that Montel Williams died after practicing for about an hour and a half Tuesday evening. Officials are not saying uh, the, that the death is a heat-related one, but uh, an autopsy is being conducted. Now, Williams is the fourth player to die during the first two weeks of fall practice this year. An assistant coach in Texas also passed away on the practice field last week. Uh, and then last year, Tyler Davenport of Lamar High School in Arkansas or, uh, died during fall camp. Massachusetts now, Gloucester City officials hoping to hop into the naming rights game by offering the title sponsorship to Newell Stadium. According to the Boston Globe, the city is selling the naming rights to its high school sports stadium for about a half a million dollars. The Gloucester High School Fighting Fishermen are the defending Division 1A Eastern Massachusetts champs. Last year, Gloucester beat Bridgewater Raynham. 34-13 to cap a perfect 13-0 season. The championship was the third in the last four years for those fighting fishermen. In Hawaii, Kahuku head coach Reggie Torres and his JV head coach have been suspended indefinitely. According to a television station there, the two will remain on suspension while school officials investigate an incident involving several students that were said to be in possession of a illegal substance. Last year, the Red Raiders, the state's top-ranked team at the time, they were 10-0, disqualified from the postseason after it was discovered that they used an ineligible player earlier in the season. And again, as we mentioned at the top, this year, 2011, the regular season, it kicks off Friday night. That's tomorrow night as Alaska and Hawaii get the regular seasons underway. And a uh, final note before we uh, break here, Kentucky has decided to keep its state championship games in Bowling Green. How are they doing that? Because they were looking to move it. Well, quite simply, Russell Athletic came in with a big sponsorship dollar. And because of it, uh, for the next four years, the Kentucky State Football Championships will be played at Western Kentucky University. So that will do it for the headlines for tonight. Going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about an interesting football team that has a documentary film coming out about it. It is called uh, Fortson Faith. Fasting and Football from Dearborn, Michigan. We're going to talk to the director of that film, Rashid Ghazi, when we come back on High School Football America on the Artist First Radio Network. The hottest technology in the world isn't being developed in Silicon Valley. In the United States Navy, more top-secret technologies are being created than ever before. Incredible machines made of stealth materials that fly by themselves. The only problem with these incredible technologies? It's a shame the enemy can't see them. To learn more, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. You've heard of being named All-Conference, but only one organization has earned the classification of being All-World. The United States Navy. Whether it's humanitarian efforts, fighting terrorism, or protecting America's freedoms, the Navy is the team that helps us all win big. To learn how you could make it to the big league, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. Navy. Accelerate your life. The Navy Seahawk helicopter has a lift capacity of over 6,000 pounds. But when it comes to helping those around the world who need it most, they lift the hopes of millions. To learn more about how the Navy is the best place to do great things, call 1-800-USA-NAVY or visit Navy.com. It will do you and the world a load of good. Navy. Accelerate your life. If you don't clean up your room, the Board of Health is going to condemn it. The Board of Health doesn't even know about your room. What's more, they don't care. You know, if you keep making that face, it's going to freeze that way. Not unless you're someplace really, really cold. Actually, a lot of the warnings moms hand out are exaggerated. If you don't get your blood pressure checked, you could have high blood pressure, not even know it, and you could die from a stroke. But she's right about that one. Call the American Heart Association or visit our website to learn more. And now back to the show with your host, Jeff Fisher. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, quite a show tonight. Uh, a couple of the best coaches in America on the show. And uh, now I'm going to change gears here to uh, an interesting situation at a high school in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, Fort in, uh, Fortson High School. The football team there uh, made up predominantly of Arab-American players. And uh, this week specifically, they're practicing from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. as the coaches observe the Muslim holy month of Ramadan that uh, started on August the 11th. In 2009, uh, director 
Rashid Ghazi from uh, North Shore Films went uh, there with a couple of cameras for 10 days at the uh, end of Ramadan. And the result was a very, very good documentary film. And Rashid joins me right now to uh, talk about the, the film itself. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, let's, uh, let's kind of get started here by informing the listeners, you know, you know, what Ramadan is all about, and then kind of put it into the context of, you know, how it affects this high school football team specifically. Sure. Um, you know, Ramadan, there's five basic pillars in the, in, the, in the faith of Islam that people are supposed to follow. And one of them is a commandment from God to fast for 30 days from sunrise to sunset during the month of Ramadan. And Ramadan is on a lunar calendar, so it's two weeks off from the calendar that we all use. So Ramadan basically moves, has been moving from the winter. So if you remember, Hakeem Elijah was fasting during the winter, during the NBA season, maybe 10 years ago, to the fall and to, well, to the, to the um, actually to the, to the summer and the fall. Um, and so the requirement of fasting is for, you know, is for adults, teenagers. Um, if you are unhealthy, if you're sick, if you're pregnant, you don't have to fast. It's one of the basic tenets of the religion. And so the interesting thing was back in 2004, a friend of mine, Chris Lawler, wrote an article for USA Today, and he talked about this team um, in Dearborn, Michigan, called Fordson High School, and they had gotten to the state semifinals during Ramadan, which was then in November. Um, and he called me up, and I'm a Muslim, I happen to be South Asian, and I was blown away by the fact that this team was predominantly Arab-American kids who were fasting during the month of Ramadan but still winning football games. And I thought it would be a completely unique and inspirational story to tell. Um, you know, for my regular career, I had done a 65-episode documentary series on Chicago area basketball players back in 2000 for Fox. Um, one of the things that I do is I'm a consultant with ESPN and televise a lot of the live high school football games that are on nationally. So John McKissick and, 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 um, and J.T. Curtis have had their teams on in the past as well. So um, I thought it would be interesting to tell a story about how these kids fast, the challenges they go through, but then also tell the story of Arab Americans in Michigan um, and, and across the U.S. Because I really felt after the September 11th attacks on our nation, after the Iraq War, most of my fellow Americans really didn't know who Muslims or Arabs were um, and didn't realize that they're just like most Americans, except they may have a different religion, they may have a little bit of a different ethnic culture, but they're here working, they've been here for a long time, and, and they're trying to live the American dream. So football kind of serves as a conduit to tell the story about the community, the town, and Arab American Muslims in this country. Sure, and I've spent some significant time in Saudi Arabia, so I understand exactly what you're talking about. But I guess it wasn't all peaches and cream. Uh, you said 2004 the article came out. Uh, you, you had some work to do to get this uh, this film done, though, right? Can you, you tell people uh, some of the hurdles you had to overcome to get this yeah, done? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the the coach at the time was not was not the coach when we actually got the rights to film. And um, he wasn't crazy about us coming in, I think, in, in part for a couple of reasons. One, whether it was this school or any other school, when you have camera crews coming into a school to be in practices, to be in kids' homes, to be in, in the schoolroom, it's always a challenge to get permission because administrators have to look out for the best interest of the school and the kids, and I, and I understood that. Um, there were also some challenges because during Ramadan they were losing some games and some of the kids were actually losing weight, and so there were some, internal, there were some internal struggles, I think. Um, so it... Once he left, the new coach, Fawad Zaban, who's the current coach, um, he had played there. He was a defensive coordinator. For the first two years, he didn't want our cameras there, in part because the pressure to win there is a lot, like any good high school program. And he wanted to focus on coaching football. In addition, the national media, from ESPN to Fox News to MSNBC, had all done articles on the story. So they kind of felt it's been told, but I, I had told them it hasn't been told in an in-depth way. An article is phenomenal. A documentary is complete, something completely different. So once Fawad gave me his permission um, in 2009, the board initially turned us down. Um, I was televising a game in Iowa for ESPN on a Friday night, got permission from the board to meet them Saturday morning, so I drove pretty much straight to Dearborn. And once the board listened to what we had to say and listened to the story that we wanted to tell and understood that we weren't going there to do some kind of undercover expose or to do something negative on the school to tell a positive story on these kids, they, they gave us their permission. And then we shot for 10 days, went back for about six to eight more days of shooting across the course of the year, and then it took us about a year to edit the documentary. It's called Forts and Faith Fasting Football, and uh, you, you've won some awards for this. It's gotten some critical acclaim. So, so you know, give me your, you know, uh, critique on your own film. What, what do you think you were able to accomplish uh, well, now that you look back on it? Yeah, I, I think what we've accomplished is this. I, I think for our fellow Americans, we've created a movie 
that gives them a unique insight into the Arab American Muslim culture and one that's never existed in this country. Most uh, one of the things I say is most of the people who nationally have spoken for the religion um, that most Americans are used to hearing are Saddam Hussein, Muhammad Gaddafi, Osama bin Laden. Those are people who don't represent me or any of the Muslim Americans across this country, or most Muslims across the world. And otherwise, most people you also hear are for paid politicians, for professional spokespeople. What this movie does is it allows you to get inside of a house and meet a mom and a dad. And the mom may wear hijab, but she's born here and she's the booster club president. It allows you to meet a kid who's got many of the same hopes and aspirations as any other kid does. Um, one of our kids is you know, trying to get a Division One scholarship to the University of Michigan. But I think the other thing that it does is it shows some of the challenges that this group has faced. Um, you know, they do an Arabic prayer um, in the locker room and on the field before the game. And that's kind of been an interesting situation. Um, the schools had to give the kids time off for the Eid holiday, which is a Muslim holiday, much like Christmas is for Christians or, or Hanukkah or Yom Kippur for Jewish kids. That was an issue the school system had to deal with. One of the star players, a lineman, his brother was a all-area running back who was falsely accused of terrorism charges because he went and bought cell phones. And his friend who was with him, his name was Osama, and one was name was Ali. And the store clerk called up, and police came and found cell phones in the car and arrested him. And they were in jail for a week until the charges were dropped. So it also shines a light on some of the challenges these people have faced. And then moreover, we, we kind of close the movie with talking about the American dream. And what you realize is that the people who've immigrated here, they came here for jobs, they came here for safety, they came here for security. And they came here for the same reasons the Italians, the Irish, the Polish, any immigrant group came to this country. Because what it has to offer versus the home countries where they were in. And despite the challenges they've felt, the biggest message I got from them is they're extremely proud to be American. They love their religion. They love their culture, but they love this country just as much. And so that was one of the big themes of the movie and one thing that I found. I thought I'd go to a community that was a little bit depressed about their state in the nation, how they're perceived, and it was nothing else. The, the message they kept giving me is don't let anyone feel sorry for us. We love being here. Anyone who gets an education in the Dearborn public school system, our kids have got just as good a chance to succeed in this nation as anybody, and we've, we've proven that. And that was a, a big theme in our movie as well. Now, uh, it's, it's fortsinthemovie.com if you want to learn more. Uh, September 9th of this year, you're going to be uh, going to see some of the AMC theaters from, uh, from your website. Tell us a little bit about the release of this film around the country. Sure. So we're excited because AMC Independence agreed to release the movie, which is a, which is a big deal for us. Um, and so on September 9th, it'll play for at least a week, and it's going to be in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, San Jose, the Washington, D.C. area, Dallas, Houston, um, Atlanta, um, and New Jersey. And if it does well, it'll expand. And so we're really trying to get people to get out and see the film. We, we've won some awards. We were at Traverse City, which is a film festival hosted by Michael Moore, won Best U.S. Doc. We won Best Documentary at the, Deer, at the Detroit Film Festival. We won the Best Documentary at a, at a film festival called Politics on Film in D.C. And what's happened is is that our, we've received such a phenomenal response to the movie, in part because it's a positive story, in part because it blends football, in part because it tells a story that no one's ever been able to tell before. So the audience's reviews have been great. Um, again, to, to see the trailer, you can go to our website. It's called www Ford Sun, so like the car Ford Sun, F-O-R-D-S-O-N, themovie.com. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, look up Ford's in the movie on Facebook. We've actually got our current trailer is a five-minute trailer that's up. It's gotten over 130,000 hits on YouTube. Our new trailer that will be released theatrically with AMC is going to be up tomorrow. Um, and we're, we're kind of making a media push right now to get people out. Our, my goal with this movie was to have my fellow Americans watch the film. So as many people can get out um, would be great. If people want to volunteer to help us, they can go to our website and volunteer and fill out a form, and we'll send you posters and postcards and flyers to hand out at your local high schools um, to promote the film as well. And, and we got a great launch on September 9th, and it, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I've had a chance to look at the trailer. It looks looks great. Can't wait to see it here in Chicago myself and check it out. So really, you know, congratulations. <laughs> Having, you know, uh, worked on a couple of documentaries in high school football, I, I know it's a, it's a work of passion for, for a lot of people. And I, I think, as you described at the beginning for yourself, uh, th this was personal to you. So congratulations on achieving a goal. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. We've had a, a great team of producers and writers and editors, and, and it's a small group that just had an idea. And it's 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 come a long way to the, the fact that we showed it to you know an admiral um, in the Navy who absolutely loved it. The State Department's interested in the film. So it's, it's a little film that's kind of finding its legs, and, and we're excited about it and appreciate the opportunity for, for us to promote it on your air. Okay, thank you very much. So that's Rashid Ghazi, Ghazi of uh, North Shore Films, the executive director. Uh, best of luck and look forward to seeing it in the theaters. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good night. Yep. 
And that's going to do it for High School Football America tonight. An action-packed show, lots uh, along the way. Uh, we, we talked to two of the most winningest coaches in high school football history, as we had on the show John McKissick from Somerville High School in South Carolina. 85 years coming up uh, in September, 85 years young, 586 victories, 14 away from 600. And the guy that's chasing him, only 43 years on the sideline as opposed to the 60 from John McKissick. So uh, J.T. Curtis is eight wins away from 500. He's at John Curtis Christian School in Louisiana, a school that was started by his father back uh, in the early 60s. And then we wrapped up here with uh, Rashid Ghazi of the uh, film Fordson Faith fasting in football as he looks at uh, the Dearborn, Michigan High School that's predominantly Arab-American as they go through fasting as they celebrate the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, and uh, that will be in AMC theaters on the independent side starting on September the 9th. I want to thank our sponsors for tonight. Blitz Group, uh, our media strategist, go to blitzgroupllc.com. Other partners, High School Rudy Awards, go to highschoolrudyawards.com and nominate a player for the 2011 season. And the National High School Coaches Association, the uh, mission statement, simple, supporting coaches and administrators, giving them all the help they need for their programs to become a member. Go to nhsca.com. If you'd like to become a sponsor of High School Football America, drop me a line at jeff at highschoolfootballamerica.com. And finally, if you want to follow along throughout the season, go to Facebook, our Facebook page. Simple. Just search it at HighSchoolFootballAmerica.com. Also on Twitter at HSFB America, or just go to www.HighSchoolFootballAmerica.com and click on the icons. It makes it that easy. Don't forget, high school football officially here tomorrow night as Hawaii and Alaska kick off the regular seasons, and then things get moving the week following that, and we're here to follow it throughout the season. It's been a fun evening. Thanks for listening. And if you uh, missed this show, you can always go, uh, or any of the past shows, go to our archives at artistsfirst.com and click on High School Football America, and you can listen to all the shows. Thanks again for listening. Drop me an email at jeff at highschoolfootballamerica.com if you've got some stories you, you feel should be on the air, and we'll talk to you next week. This is High School Football America on the Artist First Radio Network.